if you're currently following this advice, you're probably slowing down your gains in the gym. There's four things I think you should avoid for best gains. And a bonus tip at the end of the video. First, the concept of stability. As much as fitness influencers would have you think that there's a ton of scientific evidence showing that an unstable exercise is worse for muscle growth, there isn't. There is one study on stability which showed similar muscle growth from a wobble board squat, a regular barbell squat, and the Smith machine squat. If an influencer is telling you that you really need to pay attention to how stable different exercises are, just keep in mind how much evidence there is for this. Theoretically, an exercise could be unstable enough that it reduces hypertrophy. Let me give you a couple of examples where that might be true. In example one, non-target muscles have to work so hard to stabilize you that you hit failure in another muscle before you actually hit the target muscle. This almost never happens in almost any exercise. Can it theoretically happen? Yes. That said, even in an exercise as unstable as the wobbleboard squat, it wasn't an issue. In example two, stability could become an issue if it causes you to end a set prematurely. For instance, I do think walking lunges are a bit worse than split squats because you can feasibly fall over during the exercise, terminating the set before the quads reach failure. Holding on to something during split squats can take away this issue altogether. Yet again though, this is a minor point at best. The reason I prefer split squats over lunges has more to do with achieving a greater stretch than it does with some arbitrary, unscientific notion of stability. In fact, stretch-based training has around 20 studies in total showing a benefit over shorter muscle length training. By comparison, stability as a concept is in its infancy and only has a single study behind it which didn't show any major benefit of increasing the stability of a very unstable exercise. Don't get me wrong, this could simply be a case of absence of direct evidence, with future studies finding that stability really does play a large role for muscle building. And I do think there's something to making an exercise as easy as possible without taking away from the stimulus for the target muscle when it comes to reducing fatigue. A bent over row versus a chest supported machine row, for example. But if someone's really pushing you to adopt or reject an exercise on the basis of stability or is making complicated technique modifications on that basis, they're overrating stability. In the same vein, it's become popular to ascribe a ton of effectiveness to certain exercises, whether it's searcher squats if you're into Eric Bugenhagen aka The Stick, barbell bent over rows if you're a viewer of the Renaissance Periodization channel, or sissy squats if you're into Ben Patrick aka Knees Over Toes Guy. Here is a reality check. There are no magic exercises for building muscle. An exercise is only as good as its characteristics. An exercise's effectiveness depends on its stretch emphasis, loadability, target muscle emphasis, time efficiency, and fatigue and stabilization required. Many exercises will meet this checklist to a similar extent and be similarly effective. Despite that fact, influencers will try to sell you one exercise as being mythically effective. Instead of thinking of individual exercises like you're going shopping and thinking, hmm, Jeff Cavalier said face pulls are good. Think of exercises in terms of their roles within your program. What muscle are you trying to target? What rep range is the exercise meant to be performed in? What equipment do you have access to? And can you streamline the process by picking exercises with similar equipment requirements? Recognizing the broader purpose of a given exercise in your program allows you to come up with good and potentially better alternatives. A few studies have shown that the rectus femoris may not grow well from compound leg movements, like the squat. So you might be tempted to add in some leg extensions and call it a day. However, digging one layer deeper, the purpose of the leg extension is to serve as a quadricep isolation movement, allowing you to train the rectus femoris effectively. Therefore, the leg extension isn't magical, and you can replace it with any exercise that falls into the quadricep isolation category. That includes the sissy squat and the reverse Nordic curl, which probably make for more effective exercises based on the exercise checklist. But even those exercises aren't magic. In certain cases, you could still do leg extensions. For instance, if you're doing super high rep quad training and these movements would be too systemically fatiguing. In my own free programs, link in the description, I specifically break things down in this fashion. Not only does thinking of your program in exercise categories help you learn as a lifter, it also prevents you from thinking that any single exercise is magical or must do. 
I'm not saying that context is everything or giving you the classic, it depends, cop out answer, but rather I'm pointing out that no exercise is magical and that there is a logical basis for evaluating which exercises you should be using. Hell, that's why I started using the tier list format in my videos. Besides selling my soul, tier lists are a great format to sneakily teach you about how to evaluate an exercise's effectiveness based on the exercise checklist, which is based on dozens of studies versus my own anecdotal feelings about an exercise. Thinking of exercises in terms of a checklist is exactly how MyAdapt works too. MyAdapt is the smartest training app soon to be on the market. It ranks exercises for you based on effectiveness. Don't like the exercise it recommends? No problem. Change it out for the next best thing and MyAdapt will learn from your choices over time and adapt. MyAdapt may be launching as early as December 2024. Go to myadapt.com now to be notified when it launches for a free trial and a lifetime discount. I promise you won't regret it. The next overrated idea in the fitness industry is to think that weight on the bar equals growth. I'm sure you've seen Jeffrey Verity Schofield critique the Technique Cyborg series. I agree with some parts of the critique. For some, this has simply been a shift from tying their ego to weight on the bar to tying their ego to how perfectly pristine their technique is, with less emphasis on actually training close to failure. However, in many lifters' reasonings, there is the implicit idea that using an exercise or technique that will allow you to move more weight will also be better for muscle growth, and that some lifters focus so much on technique, they're just going too light. There are cases where this could be true. A few studies looking at weight on the bar versus muscle growth achieved have found that lifting less than around 20 to 30% of your one rep max may limit muscle growth. However, in the range of 30 to 85% of your max, as long as you go to failure, it doesn't seem to matter. Keep in mind, with a normal tempo of a few seconds on the eccentric and an explosive concentric, lifters can do around 50 reps with 30% of their max. Let's say you can bench two plates. No one in their right minds is going to be thinking about benching 70 pounds for a work set in that case. No matter how much you're being a technique cyborg or focusing on technique, going too light is actually quite difficult, provided you truly push yourself close to failure. I also see this claim thrown around when it comes to exercises that are just straight up harder exercises. Look, I find the expression horse cocking big weights as funny as the next lad. But just because you can use less weight on a well-performed dumbbell fly than a half rep dumbbell press doesn't mean you're growing less muscle in your chest. You need to remember that the weight you're lifting is not how much tension the muscle is experiencing. If I do dumbbell flies with the same weights with my arms nearly locked out versus very bent, my pecs will be under way more tension with my arms nearly locked out. A bro might call me out on not lifting sufficiently heavy without understanding that the weight on the bar is not the weight on the muscle. Likewise, some bros will compare a big compound movement like pull-ups to an isolation movement like pullovers and instantly assume that the compound movement is better since you're shifting more load. Again, the weight you're moving is not the weight on the muscle. Finally, some bros will use this logic to justify just using bad technique. And I get it. Letting your technique get worse week to week to lift bigger weights does make you feel like you're progressing faster than you actually are. But we do know a thing or two about technique. We know that we probably want to control the eccentric for at least a couple of seconds. We know we don't want to skimp on the stretch, which usually means using less weight. So the thinking that horse cocking big weights will make you bigger probably isn't true. Push very hard and be close to failure, but don't worry too much about the weight on the bar. A classic from the TikTok high intensity training community. The idea that doing anything over eight reps is pointless for muscle growth. The reasoning for this idea is predicated on the effective reps theory. The effective reps theory states that the last five to eight reps of a set are the only ones that stimulate muscle growth. This can be achieved with higher rep training as well. In a set of 15 repetitions to failure, for example, the weight is light enough that you could lift the weight with only some of your muscle fibers producing maximal force for the first few reps. However, by the time you get to around 10 reps in, your muscle fibers are fatigued and you need to bring in more hands on deck by activating all muscle fibers fully. In fact, the biggest muscle fibers only activate when fatigue is set in or when the load is sufficiently heavy. But proponents of the effective reps theory would argue that the first 10 repetitions of the set or so didn't stimulate muscle growth well. Instead, they'd recommend cutting out the middleman, so to speak. 
pick a weight heavy enough that you can only do five to eight reps and your body will be forced to recruit and use all muscle fibers from the start of the set. Therefore, all reps performed will be effective reps. If you assume that only the last five to eight reps of a set are effective, this truly does imply that doing anything over eight reps is pointless. After all, you're still working out, creating fatigue, but for no additional muscle growth. Only those last eight reps before failure matter. Unfortunately, strict proponents of the effective reps theory are wrong. On the one hand, studies do show that taking a set to failure builds more muscle than not taking it to failure. However, many studies have also found substantial growth even when training more than a few reps shy of failure. If only those last few reps before failure resulted in muscle growth, these studies are impossible to explain. A looser interpretation of the effective reps theory is more reasonable. Reps become a bit more effective as you approach failure, since more muscle fibers tend to be stimulated. Going heavier and staying below eight reps simply accelerates this process. By using a heavier load, that instantly puts you close to failure. There are also studies showing that combining different rep ranges leads to more muscle growth than always sticking with the same rep range. So always sticking below eight reps could actually be harming your muscle growth. Unlike sticking below eight reps, wearing rascal apparel only makes you look more muscular. The best training clothing in the game. Go to rascalapparel.com and use code WOLF at checkout for 10% off and to support me in the process. For our final topic, the idea that you need to be lean for best health. The fitness industry tends to conflate appearance or even body fat percentage with health. Do you really need to be shredded for your best health? Unlikely. A meta-analysis by Jayeti and colleagues found that men with around 22% of body fat tended to see the best health outcomes. For women, this was closer to 35% body fat. This is substantially higher in body fat than most lifters are. There are valid reasons for fat loss. If your body fat percentage is much higher than this, you may be in worse health. If you'd like to change your appearance, losing fat is arguably the fastest way to do this. If you're sick of bulking, that's another compelling reason. But most people overestimate how lean they need to be to be in great health. Just consistently exercising and going for walks has very underrated health benefits by comparison. Instead of looking at your body fat percentage to assess your health, I recommend looking at your waist circumference to height ratio. Studies suggest that people with a waist to height ratio under 0.5 tend to be in better health than people with a waist to height ratio of over 0.5. If you feel like you've bulked too far and your waist is over half your height, I would recommend a cut. Otherwise, you're probably not unhealthy on account of carrying too much body fat. Contrary to popular belief, I do not think you need to be particularly lean to be in great health. But I want to hear from you. Did I get anything wrong? Do you disagree with my takes? Let me know in the comments below. Dr. My Wolf, Wolf Coaching, have a phenomenal day.